Hey everyone, this is Paul Finley, and uh, for week two, I've actually chosen uh, Marcy and Ted Hoff as my pioneer uh, of choice, uh, even though the video uh, from the first uh, week on Silicon Valley only barely touched on him and towards the end of the video itself, um, I believe that he was actually the, the, the most crucial part of uh, the development of the microprocessor, and uh, that's the reason why I chose him. So uh, here's my presentation. This is my first time using uh, PowerPoint, so nothing really fancy or anything, but hopefully it works well, and uh, yeah, thanks. It has been a little over 43 years since the first microprocessor was released to the public and it is hard to imagine our lives without it. From our laptops down to our remote controls, these small chips process our world. One of the first names that we associate with this invention is Robert Noyce. The co-founder of Intel was the face of the company until his death in 1990 and is also the face of the microprocessor. While he may have received most of the recognition for this, we cannot forget the major contributors behind the scenes that made it happen. Marcian Ted Hoff was the main architect on the first microprocessor, and I would like to briefly recognize the journey he took to get there. Born October 28, 1937, Ted graduated high school in 1954. Before he went to college, he had a summer job at the company his father worked for. He already had a love for electronics, and his job gave him the chance to work with magnetic cores and transistors. He completed his electronic engineering bachelor degree in 1958 and moved on to Stanford University to continue his education. After he received his master's degree in 1959, alongside Professor Bernard Woodrow, he helped develop an LMS algorithm for adaptive systems that is still used in modems today. By 1962, he had received his PhD and decided to stay on at Stanford to work on government-sponsored research on adaptive systems. It was through his connections at Stanford that he was sought out by Robert Noyce. Hired by Intel in September of 1968, Ted was their 12th employee and was brought in for the study and development of semiconductor memory. In June of 1969, Intel was sought after by Japan's Nippon Calculating Company to develop new chips for their Busicom 141 PF calculator, and Ted became the liaison between Intel and Nippon engineers. The initial calculator design called for about 12 different chips to function, which ranged from controlling the screen, the keyboard interface, and the drum printer. One of the first changes that Ted implemented was to change from the shift register memory that Nippon wanted to use to a dynamic random access memory system. By doing so, he was able to reduce the number of transistors needed, saving on the overall cost of making chips as well as leading to simplifying other aspects of the chip. In September of 1969, Intel hired Stanley Mazur to help Ted with development, and the two had a proposal for Nippon by October. The final design took the total amount of 12 chips down to 4, and they were given the go-ahead to proceed. By April of 1970, the concept was ready, and Dr. Federico Fascine, who was well known for his silicone design capability, was brought in for the final design. By November of 1971, Intel had released their first advertisement for the new 4 2004 processor, and the rest, as they say, is history. So immediate questions that actually come to my mind uh, when it comes to this is, uh, what if Robert Noyce had not found Ted? Uh, and also, uh, in the Nippon situation, um, you know, what if he would have told him to stick with the original plan for the chips themselves? Um, and, you know, just stuck with the, the 12 uh, instead of actually uh, trying to uh, make it more efficient. Uh, also, uh, for that matter, I guess, what if Nippon had, you know, gone to a different company? Would we actually even have Intel today, uh, or would everything be made by Texas Instruments or another company? Um, you know, would we have the same technology today? Um, you know, if not, what, what would it look like? You know, it's just a, a few of those questions that actually come into play. Um, also, um, the influence of his father and his younger life, you know, if he would have encouraged him to go a different route, would we even have the technology that we have today? A lot of different scenarios that, uh, you know, just kind of go through my head as we go through this on here. So as my uh, resources are actually popping up here, um, just want to take time to say thanks for uh, for listening and watching and uh, hopefully this was informative uh, and hopefully it uh, kind of made sense and yeah, thanks for listening.